Good morning, fellow cybernauts. Um, I'm Paul Trester, a program planning lawyer with the Department of Continuing Legal Education. Perhaps that should be cy uh, cyberlings. But I'd like to welcome you all to this morning's program, Internet Shifting Your Practice into Cyberspace. Um, I think Louis Eisen is probably, our today's chair, Louis Eisen, is probably already very well known to uh, all of you as the author of Technology and Practice, uh, uh, a columnist, um, a member of CSALT, and, um, and instructor in the, uh, in the computer education facility. Uh, also, more recently, the author of Canadian Lawyer's Internet Guide, copies of which are on display. Uh, outside, and I certainly invite you to uh, to take a look at that. Uh, you will all have a binder of materials, which contains biographies of all the faculty you'll meet, be meeting throughout the course of the morning, and also contains a document I'd like to draw to your attention, and that's this gray program evaluation form. Um, as many of you may be sick of hearing by now, these are in large measure what guide us in planning programs that will best meet your practice needs, and we'd be greatly obliged if you could remove it and keep it by you and complete it in the, uh, in the course of the day and leave it with us at the registration desk outside. Um, if for any reason you can't do so, please do fax or mail it in. Each one is read carefully and uh, by ourselves and, uh, and by our program chair. With no further ado, I'm proud to introduce Louis Eisen. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, everybody. Is this on? Yes, good. All right. Um, I have uh, for you this morning a panel of uh, four. I know it looks like three, but it's really four. Uh, four pioneers in the field of internet, uh, internet and the practice of law. Uh, to a degree, uh, we all get to get, be pioneers when we get on this. This is a very new field. Uh, I, uh, I can assure you that the lawyers in the United States are struggling with the same issues. They are no farther ahead than, than we are on them. Um, the, uh, the fourth speaker this morning will be joining us a little later, but this is a, uh, the format of today is that we will let everybody talk for a bit about his own area of expertise. And the rest of the panel members will make comments and we invite uh, comments from yourselves. We're going to take advantage of the fact that we're a small group today and, and uh, not stand on formality too much. Uh, so I'm going to introduce all speakers now and uh, these introductions I hope will stand for the, uh, the rest of the morning. Uh, next to me, uh, in order actually, I, I suppose of the, uh, the agenda, Rob McEwen is uh, sitting in the middle there. Uh, a number of lawyers on the, uh, are, are already on the internet on, on web pages. A number of law firms have set up web pages. Uh, what's interesting about Rob's site is that he runs two types of sites. He runs a web page on the World Wide Web and he runs a BBS locally. Now Rob is based in St. Catharines and I understand is supposed to be practicing law at some point during the day, but uh, runs these two separate uh, boards which are completely diametrically opposed, the internet being a, a global um, advertising, if, if you like, a global source of, uh, of uh, a, a, a global focal point for the firm, and the BBS being a purely local focal point. Uh, and if I'm not incorrect, you can actually get to the BBS from the internet? Oh, if that were true. Oh, yes. No, you just get instructions. Instructions on how to call locally. Uh, so we have, uh, so Rob is uh, here specifically because he's experimenting with both types of uh, online approaches and uh, I'll ask him to talk about those. Um, next to, uh, to my left here, uh, Michael Erdl uh, from Deeth Williams Wall is uh, in the enviable position of having almost 80% of his clients online to some degree. Uh, now, he has a particular clientele that tends to be high tech, so not all of us will be in the position that we will have such a high proportion of our clients online, but we have very uh, internet savvy clients in this case, and problems of security and encryption, and what you actually, what precautions you actually can take and should take uh, come up very frequently in his practice, and it happens to be his area of expertise at the same time. So I've asked him to come and uh, speak. He spoke at the Technology for Lawyers conference last year, some of you may have been at, and uh, hopefully he'll help us solve some of these problems. 
Our third speaker is uh, Malcolm Crombie. He will be joining us a little later. Malcolm has uh, taken on the publishing aspects of uh, the internet. Now, Malcolm is uh, not your typical internet publisher. And so the typical internet publisher is somebody who decides that nobody knows me yet. Uh, I don't have a real publisher. I'm just going to start sending things out on the internet, and maybe somebody will discover me. Well, Malcolm, in fact, has been published by one of the law publishers, but is experimenting with a new medium. And just so you don't think that uh, Malcolm is in any enviable position because he's at Macmillan Binch and has a lar large firm, in fact, Malcolm is doing this by himself at home. So you could email him at Macmillan Binch, but he says he doesn't get it. You have to email him at his, his, private, uh, his private number. Uh, finally, Mark Eisen, at the very end, uh, is in the unenviable position, I would say, of dealing with the area of law that I find most convoluted, uh, and that is copyright infringement and trademark. Uh, I say convoluted in this area because from my perspective, and I, I'm not an intellectual property lawyer, the internet seems to be breaking every rule that we have about copyright, and breaking it as a matter of course. And when I look at the legal issues, I throw up my hands and say, I can't I don't know how any lawyer can deal with the copyright issues on the net in a meaningful way. And uh, certainly looking at the uh, report of the, privacy, of the um, Federal Commission on the Information Highway, uh, I don't know that they, in fact, have, have come up with solutions which are, are going to be as uh, practical as, as they expect either. Uh, this is an area of law that will continue to develop, and I think today we can only broach the surface, um, but uh, we're going to try and deal with those issues uh, as well. Uh, the format, as I say, each speaker will give uh, a talk, maybe about 20, 25 minutes, on his own topic, and uh, there will be contributions from the other speakers, because being lawyers, you know we have opinions about everything, even if they're not in our own area of expertise, and uh, we invite contributions from, uh, from the audience. Without further ado, if I can uh, ask Rob, please. Thank you, Louis. Um, just by way of introductory remarks, uh, I guess first and foremost, happy Groundhog Day. I, I haven't heard the results, but I, I don't think it's favorable. Um, so you know a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, I'm in a, a smaller market than Toronto, being in St. Catharines, about 150,000 people roughly. Um, there are probably a dozen uh, major law firms in the area, uh, most of which have resources which pale in comparison uh, to what uh, the larger firms in Toronto have. Having said that, I don't feel that that's particularly relevant to my talk today because uh, the World Wide Web and, and the Internet in general is not a, a resource-intensive undertaking in that you can spend as much money or as little money or as much time or as little time as you want and you feel is appropriate. So uh, as uh, Lewis said, uh, Malcolm, although he's at Macmillan Binch, does most of this himself. And that same opportunity is available to every practitioner, of course, subject to your schedule. Um, how many people here now have web pages, either individually or as part of their firm? So three or four out of the uh, maybe 35 or so that's here right now. Well, I'm hoping in, in six months, if I had the opportunity to canvas you again, it would be uh, almost unanimous. It really is an easy and inexpensive way to market your services uh, to specific markets or generally. Um, now, uh, when doing this kind of undertaking, we tend to measure success or failure by the bottom line. And with the web in its infancy, I'm suggesting that that isn't necessarily the yardstick we should be applying at this early time. If you're going to develop a web page this afternoon and expect the first client to call you tomorrow morning saying, I saw your web page and I want to give you this huge file, uh, that's simply not going to happen. But what may happen is that you will be in a position to strengthen uh, relationships with existing clients and perhaps troll for new ones. Uh, as you know, and you have done so yourself, like the people uh, are always uh, checking the internet to see what's new and often if they're into one professional area, a link to other professional support services will come up. Hopefully your law firm will be one of them. By way of personal experience, I can say that uh, we first got onto the web in 94. 
and we have had probably half a dozen significant hits where it's led to substantial business. By substantial business, I mean whether it's a, a major personal injury action or uh, some other type of commercial litigation, um, which is nice, and we've made enough money off it to probably pay for it forever, because after all, it, it doesn't uh, take much money. I'll get into that in a sec. But probably the more significant benefit to our firm has been the entrenchment of our existing relationships with either current clients or business associates. <coughs> I'm a commercial lawyer, at least uh, I should, in my spare time, I'm primarily a computer person, but uh, in any event. Um, uh, as a commercial lawyer, we rely on uh, accountants uh, quite a bit, and we have ongoing relationships with a couple of the accounting houses. And uh, being on the web, as they are, has uh, helped uh, build and strengthen the bond that we have with them, so that when they get clients in without lawyers, uh, we're one of the firms they think of, and, and vice versa, of course. Um, as well, clients, as they hop on the Internet, um, are quite frankly impressed that their lawyers are keeping current with the technology. And let me caution you, uh, I mentioned this in the paper in more detail, your client's expectations are going to drive your firm's technology if it's not being driven from within already. Your clients are going to expect you to be current on this technology. <coughs> Interesting enough, the law may also expect you to be current on this technology as well. There's a growing area of law suggesting that as lawyers, we now have a duty to browse as part of any research undertaking. Uh, information on the web is public domain, and there is already a reported case in the United States uh, where a law firm was unsuccessful in failing to plead information that had been on the web. <clears throat> I, uh, the site's in the paper if you're interested. I think it was a Wisconsin case, but I'm, I'm not certain. As I'm going along, and as Lewis uh, mentioned initially, please jump in any time. Uh, don't worry about interrupting. I'd prefer you to raise points when they're currently being discussed as opposed to the end where we're not all in the same thought process any longer. So if you've got any questions, jump in. Today's conference may well be a, a, a one-shot deal, so if we happen to get off on a tangent, I don't think it's a problem. If there's a particular area of the web you want to explore, by all means, uh, I encourage you to drive the discussion as opposed to me. <clears throat> the upside of being on the World Wide Web, uh, I think, is fairly obvious. You've got exposure at a, a reasonable cost. Um, you've got uh, creative processes at your fingertips. You can uh, present the image of the firm in any way that you feel is appropriate. It provides you with a publishing medium. It provides you with another link to your clients. After all, they can email you off your web page. The downside, uh, I, personally, being a user, I don't think there is much of a downside, but nonetheless, uh, there is some cost and time involved. Now, most internet service providers will give you space for a web page as part of your subscription. So, you know, if you're at IO or Passport or whatever and you're paying 20, 30 bucks a month, uh, depending on how many accounts you have, uh, chances are that includes uh, space for your web page. Most providers will help you and encourage you to put up a page. So you're not incurring uh, an expense for storage or operation. Really what the expense is, is getting it up and going and maintaining it. Now depending on uh, your firm, your resources, uh, your target market, um, you may or may not want to hire an outside company to design your page for you. There are a number of good organizations now that are specializing in, in web design and their products are very impressive. What you need to do is ask yourself, is that what our firm needs? And uh, also look at what type of client you have and what kind of client you're trying to attract. If your clients being at a larger firm are multinational companies or perhaps technology firms, uh, if you're assisting in Corel's purchase of WordPerfect, for example, your page is going to have to be sophisticated because your clients will expect it. If you are uh, a general practice firm of maybe a dozen lawyers uh, doing everything from uh, uncontested divorces uh, to a bit of commercial litigation, your page can be much different than that of, say, McCarthy Tetros. Uh, and let that guide your time and investment of money into designing your page. Now, I'm suggesting that each one of us uh, has the ability to design a page uh, Right now, the World Wide Web is using HTML coding, 
which is not a programming language, although it, it is almost as intimidating initially, but it really isn't. Most of us are familiar with WordPerfect 5.1, which essentially formats text based on uh, reciprocal anchors, if you will. For example, in WordPerfect 5.1, if you wanted to bold uh, something, you would simply surround the word that you wanted bolded with the bold anchors. So when you reveal the codes, you see text, a bold code, the word, and the closing bold code. That's exactly the way HTML works. You're simply surrounding the text that you want to format with anchors. I encourage you to explore um, the web page that I put up specifically for today's conference. The URL is in uh, one of the footnotes in the paper. And what's on that web page is um, links to all the software that are mentioned in the paper, as well as what will be mentioned by the panel today. So I can hear the pages turning. I can't remember what footnote it's in, but it's, it's there, trust me. Um, and uh, as well on that page are HTML editors uh, for the downloading, uh, most of which are either freeware or shareware. Okay. I've flagged a couple in particular that I've used and I think are really good introductory tools. I've also thrown up some freeware ones which I haven't tried. Um, I decided to make those available specifically for the conference to encourage people to get in and try it. Um, I knew nothing about HTML when I started and really your first page is nothing more than a weekend project. If you're familiar with WordPerfect 5.1, you're familiar with the concept of anchoring text with format codes and the HTML editors make it extremely easy. The good ones have what are called rules checking, which constantly checks the integrity of the page. It won't let you insert a code where it doesn't belong. It won't let you save a page that isn't properly coded. Uh, when you couple that with leaving Netscape running and always toggling to see what the page is going to look like at the end, it really isn't as massive or intimidating undertaking as, as you first may think. Yep. People who are looking for that, uh, that address will find it on page 33 of his material. Okay. As well as I've taken a, a screenshot of the web page. Actually, it's also on page one. <laughs> <laughs> At the bottom. Um, uh, par pardon me? <laughs> Um, part of why we're here today is marketing uh, the services and to that end you'll notice that the URL is simply an address to my own page where the CLE is a subpage off it because after all if I gave you the CLE URL directly I wouldn't be marketing myself now would I? So, uh, as, as you go to the uh, my home page uh, there's a direct link to the CLE program which includes everything that's in the paper, including a copy of the paper itself, by the way. Um, there's an appendix to my materials where step by step I go through the construction of a sample web page, uh, including providing you the coding, uh, what each uh, code does and why it's there. And then I've taken that code and put it uh, onto the web as well. So when you get to the CLE web page for today's program, that will be one of your options to view the sample page that is created in the appendix. Um, I, uh, despite what uh, the copyright panelists may say, I encourage you to take my work, that sample page, and simply replace your firm name with the sample when I've done, and you've got your first page up and running. Okay. <clears throat> it's, it's not an implied license, it's an express license, I guess, isn't it? So. Um, while you're on this point, Rob, can I ask you a question? Do you have any suggestions for how to avoid the home video syndrome, the, uh, the having a sort of an unprofessional looking page that mm -hmm. if, uh, obviously we can't all, all afford, you know, $3,000 graphic designers to come up and do something. Yeah, that's a very good point. We all have our, our preferences and we've all surfed the web. Um, we know what we like and what we don't like. Um, when you're surfing the web, uh, make a mental note of how long you wait for a page to load and at what point you give up. And let that be your rule of thumb when you're designing your own page. Um, there are pages that are extremely impressive that I simply won't wait to load. Or if I do, I've gone into Netscape and turned off the, uh, the graphics, um, which I don't recommend as the web grows because more and more people are using image maps without 
a text-only option. By the way, please, please, please have a text-only option in your page. There are an awful lot of people still uh, on the web without graphics capabilities uh, or choose not to use them. Probably three-quarters of the time I spend on the web, I'm doing it through an alpha connection uh, because I just don't want to take the time for, for graphics to load in. Yeah. Something nice. Uh, well, um, two thousand bucks. Is there some place on list that we can get? Not that I know of. Providers who've done some of these for their I suspect that if you go on any of the major law firm pages, um, the designers of the page are normally linked to at the bottom. Um, this page was created by you know Webmasters Inc and uh, their URL will be linked to from the main page. Um, I think that will probably suffice. I don't know of a list anyway. I, yeah. I oh, do they? Hmm, interesting. Any idea of the cost? When you see uh, the sample page, sorry? Includes graphics as well. And an indemnity from them? An indemnity from them? <laughs> um, uh, I, I say that only half in jest because uh, that is an issue that comes up. I mean, you're, you're going to be publishing material that someone else is giving you. I hope they're assuring that they're not themselves violating any copyright. But uh, you'll notice in the appendix, the sample page, the coding is very minimal. Um, to get a basic page up and going, there are only about 10 codes you need to know. And from those 10, those are the building blocks where you can get as fancy as you want. Uh, the easiest way to spru up, spruce up a page is with graphics. And as Lewis was asking, um, there is a tendency to sort of go that, that home video route where you, you have the neighbors over and make, make them watch two hours of, of your, your two-year-old waving goodbye. Um, I caution you against the overuse of graphics. But as I say, surf the web and, and pick and choose what you like and abandon what you don't like. Um, the home page that our firm has uh, is very small. Uh, the only graphic on the main page is a logo, um, which uh, nice and small, if you save it in 16 colors, instead of 16 million, it'll load faster. There are other formatting things you can do to get your page to load faster, but those are, are beyond the scope of today. Um, uh, interesting enough, though, one of the links on the uh, CLE page is to uh, a whole series of pages that Netscape has developed on how to write HTML as well. And uh, so that gives you some nice online help if you need it. Um, now, let's say, for example, that, that uh, in a, a fit of enthusiasm, uh, you go home this weekend and code your first HTML page, which is completely plausible. Uh, from knowing nothing to your first page, using companion materials, whether it's the paper or uh, some of the shareware editors that are out there. It is a single day task, maybe even a long afternoon task. It's not something that's going to take weeks and months. Having said that, I caution uh, people in the paper about overdoing it. This isn't something that needs to be a mammoth undertaking. In particular, please don't uh, set up an ad hoc committee to review the page and, and discuss its implementation. That'll slow you down and, and waste your resources. This is something that a small group or an individual can do uh, with the firm's blessing and doesn't need to uh, eat into administrative time at the firm. Okay? It's not for every firm, but at our firm, um, I'm responsible for the web pages and their design and uh, changes aren't approved by anyone. Now, rest assured, if they don't like it, they'll let me know. But every little change I make, I don't have to slide by some partnership committee to get approved. That kind of administration uh, is really going to hamper getting your first page up and running. There's nothing that frustrates me more than, than talking to firms and, and they say, well, we're, we're working on our page. And I, I, I just simply can't understand that. To me, the route to go is get a basic page up there, get it up there this weekend, and then work on, on the sophistication of it. It's not something that uh, you need to uh, have sort of an end product as your first page. And I think too many lawyers and law firms get trapped into the notion that they need a McCarthy Tetro page uh, as their first version. And that happened to have been their first version, but they also paid 
a, a firm to do it for them. Okay? I mentioned the Carthage Tetro page because it's very sophisticated. And I also applaud it. I think it's, it's a good use of the technology. There's really good, helpful information on their page as opposed to merely advertising. What would you think of a, a page that just had the firm's name and something under that said, under construction, <laughs> ready in two weeks? Yeah. Um, that's just a personal preference. Uh, because I consider the web page to be dynamic, it's always under construction. So I don't say so on our pages. Uh, each page, each version of the page, is complete in and of itself. Next week it'll be different. But I don't have a under construction marker on mine. Um, I think that's just a preference. I, I don't, I don't uh, have a suggestion. Yes? Well, um, we get a fair bit of junk mail. Uh, we have uh, the lawyers listed uh, on sub pages uh, and email addresses for each lawyer off their particular page. And we get, it's not really junk mail, it's blank mail. People saying, I wonder what will happen if I click here. And then, then the mailer comes up and they panic a bit and cancel out. So we get a lot of uh, either incomplete or, or simply blank mail. But um, uh, that, although a downside, because obviously you've got to purge that from the system, it's minimal. It really is minimal. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, uh, email addresses, I think, are a key part of doing business. Uh, and you certainly wouldn't uh, not put your uh, postal address on your business card or your web page. And similarly, I don't think you should omit your email address either. Um, let's say someone's on your page and they want to get in touch with you. Uh, why not give them the means to do that immediately by having a, a link to your email address? Yep. Well, um, uh, I'll, I'll actually cover that in the BBS in just a sec. I'm only about 30 seconds away from getting there. Um, in terms of, of tracking effectiveness, let's say you've got your web page up and running. Um, you've done it for a minimal amount of money. Uh, then rest assured your partners and associates are going to come to you and say, well, is it working? And how do you know? Tell me again why we did this. Um, there are a couple of mechanisms that you can utilize to track the effectiveness of your web page. And again, these are simply guidelines. There is no hard and fast rule other than direct business. If you get somebody who comes into your office and says, I saw you on the web and that's why I'm here, obviously that's direct confirmation. But I'm suggesting that'll be relatively rare for the time being. Um, what we do on our web page is count the number of hits we get. Each time the page is loaded, a file is incremented by one and a log is kept as to where the hit came from. So we can, at the end of each month, say, well, this month we had 60 hits from these addresses. <laughs> 10 of them were internal, because we can tell by the return address. And the other 50 were from, from points uh, outward. Um, the number of hits is, to me, an indication at this early stage whether it's worthwhile or not. And you can certainly build on that by promoting yourself to other web pages, uh, the law list, for example, uh, Carswell's, uh, any number of, of sort of resource places are keeping lists of law firms. You get yourself listed on there, you'll, your hits will go up. Now, there's no way to distinguish between whether it's you know, a 15-year-old who's uh, accidentally hit your page instead of where he wanted to go, or whether it's you know, the bank down the street. Uh, at this point in the technology's infancy, there is no way to distinguish that. Um, I'm suggesting that regardless of sort of the affirmation you'll get from keeping these statistics, it's worth doing anyway. Um, either the internet is going to go away or it's going to become even bigger and more common as a business tool. I'm obviously banking on the latter and so I'm not using direct hits to our page as uh, guiding uh, our firm's decision to continually invest uh, time and money into the page. Uh, that's, again, a personal decision you'll have to make. Uh, the fact that you're here today, though, is a pretty good indication that you recognize that, that uh, the web is going to be an important business tool for you and you need to know more about it. And if you get nothing else from today's uh, talk, at least my portion, I hope it's 
that it's something that's relatively easy to do with the paper and, and the website you now have the tools to do it so really the only two steps now are getting the page going and getting whatever internal approval you need to accomplish that before I jump off on a BBS is any uh, questions about web yes Yeah, um, graphics, uh, in terms of developing a logo, um, I, I don't have an immediate answer because our firm already had a logo. Um, I guess, I mean, it on the web graphics, so oh, it having it which, sorry? How do you get it on your page? Okay. So let's say you have a logo or something you want to put on there. Mm -hmm. How do you get it on without hiring a, uh, you know, a consultant or something? Yeah. Um, a logo, depending on how sophisticated or complicated it is, can either simply be recreated. Um, our particular logo was simply color and, and certain fonts, uh, which was easily uh, duplicated in Corel. Other logos, which are more complicated, may not be so easily produced by us weekend warriors. Uh, you may need to scan it in. Now, more and more firms have scanners. Uh, otherwise, you can pay someone to do it. I've paid to have things scanned, and depending on what it is, uh, the most I think I've ever paid is 10 bucks to have something scanned in. Um, and the only thing you need to, to be aware of is it needs to be in a certain graphic format. Now, technically speaking, the web will take any type of format, but most browsers don't have built-in support for all the different kinds. Um, the most common is uh, GIF or GIF, um, and I recommend that you stick with that for the time being. That's the one that Netscape natively supports and for the time being uh, I don't see that changing. So really what you need is a, is a uh, graphic file that you can produce one of two ways either by having it scanned or by duplicating it by hand in, in a graphics package and simply saving it as a GIF file. Now having said that uh, the sample page again in the appendix uh, does utilize uh, a made-up logo um, and so the coding of how to insert a logo into the page is covered in the appendix. Okay. Again, my only caution, <coughs> excuse me, is to keep the images small. Uh, uh, there are firms around, for example, that will have a picture of their uh, office or have pictures of each of the individual lawyers. Uh, to get that kind of uh, reproduction quality, the uh, photographs need to be fairly large in computer size. They'll take forever to load. Um, that's up to you whether you decide that that's an asset to your page or not. Uh, we decided not, to, we have uh, all the lawyers in our firm, we have their uh, pictures digitized for uh, publishing purposes, you know, for magazines or whatever, it's great to be able to send a, a digital photograph. But on the web page, I stayed right away from it. It's, it they just take too long to load under, under current speeds. So, can yes. I, can I offer, I'm oh, sorry, a different sorry. answer to, uh, to this question? I, uh, <clears throat> uh, I believe that uh, the graphics that you put on your website, in fact, are art. And unless you have a propensity to designing art, you should let an artist do it because uh, it, it looks different. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your logo happens to look very good, but I find you the exception as opposed to the rule. Um, I had uh, put a bit of clip art on my site and quickly decided it looked very, very tacky and took it down and decided against graphics completely. Uh, I have paid approximately $400 for the graphics that are now on, on my website. The graphic designer designed a logo that would be appropriate to the web, knew about uh, what things looked like on a screen as opposed to designing something that would look good on paper, designed some little graphics to act as links, and navigational aids, and those are the ones that I will continue to use throughout the development of my pay. I consider that an initial uh, investment and uh, what, what yeah. just a, a point too there are sources just like there are clip art uh, packages available for uh, for computer presentations and, and there are um, there are uh, sources for all of the little icons and logos and arrows and 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 uh, the things that you see on web pages um, and most of them are, are freely available. They can be downloaded. Mm -hmm. the people who, who, who do web page design commercially 
will supply them most of them have have libraries of of art and icons that mm -hmm. that they use different kinds of buttons and and all of that and, and uh, so uh, there there is a lot that you can do that is professional quality without having to to hire a professional to design it specifically for you yep. so, so that's another option too actually that's a very good point and something that's not on the CLE page and I'll put it up I'll try and put it up this weekend. I'll, I'll link to some of the uh, graphics libraries that are out there uh, that simply house thousands of images for the taking. Now something I didn't cover in your question was what do you do if you don't have a logo? Uh, it's not something I can really help you with. Uh, I concur with Lewis 100% pay someone to do it. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Do you just keep the same old page up there and just tap on other pages? Yeah. You well, you'll see, um, uh, again, I'm, I'm just kind of jumping around. The more detailed answers are in the paper. And one of the points I stress is make sure your page is kept current. Um, there's nothing worse than a page that's created once and then just stagnates. You'll never get repeat visits. Once people realize it's not being kept up, uh, they'll stop browsing it. Uh, a common practice on web pages is the very last line in the page is to put the date it was last updated. So you'll see uh, in, on most pages at the bottom, this page was last updated on February 2nd. Um, the initial page that we use, uh, the first page virtually never changes. It's, it's like the, the cover uh, to your firm, the cover of your firm brochure or whatever. It's our name, our logo, a little blurb, and the links. It's all our sub-pages. That change. So one of the links off the main page will be articles. Well, you go to that articles page, that's changing all the time as, as uh, the lawyers author new works. Um, initial setup time, um, including uh, the learning curve of, of HTML itself, uh, from knowing nothing to having a complete web page, 10 hours. And then ma maintaining it, um, I'm not a good example. Uh, I spend an inordinate amount of time uh, on the different computer things, as Lewis joked about initially. I, I do manage to do a little billable work, but uh, not as much as I should, I suppose. Um, I spend two hours a week on our web pages. Not very much, really. Um, and I'm suggesting that's probably higher than average recognizing that we're doing everything in-house. Um, we don't pay anyone for anything when it comes to technology. Now, th of course, that, that's going to be the exception for the time being. But um, yeah, I would say 10 hours start to finish on your first page. Uh, if you cut and paste the sample, a whole lot less than that. You know, you've got a page in less than an hour if you use the template that's in the material. Okay. But to truly understand it, six to 10 hours. So, any Would other? You suggest uh, designing a web page to accommodate word searches. For example, selecting the words that you use to say, instead of types of law practiced and then uh, insolvency, commercial, to actually say commercial law so that the two words will appear together and are more likely to draw a hit when someone is specifically looking for a commercial lawyer. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, that's a strategy uh, that you can adopt from the outset or once you become more familiar with, with the way the web works. Uh, Many of the search engines uh, search are specific word searches or they're searching simply titles of pages. Uh, but bear that in mind that the words you use are what the web engines uh, will be viewing when they're searching uh, on subject matter. So make sure law or lawyers is mentioned uh, in titles to pages as well as in the documents themselves, as well as the areas of practice, people's names, so if someone's on the web and searching for, for John Smith, if his name doesn't actually appear on your page, your page will get missed. Um, so I, I think that's a very good point. The, the wording you choose will uh, dictate how your firm uh, is exposed during a web search. If you really want to get hit a lot, apparently if you put the word porn in your page, you get <laughs> more searches for that word than any other word on yeah. the internet. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, won't, I won't cover uh, sort of 
the design of a page itself. The coding is covered. Design is simply the creative process, and, and, and that's going to be up to you. Uh, again, look at the pages that are out there, what you like and what you don't like. Okay? Um, the web exposure that our firm has received has been extremely beneficial, but it pales in comparison to the exposure we've had from running a bulletin board service, or BBS. Now, uh, probably most of us uh, are familiar with BBSs as something that existed maybe 10 years ago and were uh, predominantly the, the medium for teenagers to, to swap illegal copies of games and, and, uh, and pornography for the most part. Um, their use and abuse, however, doesn't detract from the value of the technology itself. We set up uh, a bulletin board in 1994 uh, specifically to service our community. So we had a target market it's not on the internet, so if it's a long distance call, long distance charges apply. As a result, we don't get long distance calls. Having said that, it provides us with a completely secure way to market ourselves within the community and to publish and provide information to a larger group than the internet does for the time being. There are still people out there with modems that aren't on the internet. Uh, a BBS uh, allows them to dial up and access information. Of course, we duplicate the key information between the web and the bulletin board. But as an example, the web page or, and sub pages, we've got about 30 or 35 pages and uh, the same number of sort of files and articles. Uh, on the bulletin board, there are 1,600 text files dealing solely with law, uh, sorted by category for people to uh, download. All the landlord and tenant forms, all the small claims court forms, the small claims court rules, that kind of thing is what's on our bulletin board. And people in the community can dial up, grab that information. It doesn't directly result in client business, but inevitably people get halfway into a project, can't finish it, and then they're calling you for help. I've got the landlord and tenant form, now what do I do? <clears throat> Similarly, the bulletin board not being on the internet is completely free of, of security issues. We've got it on a standalone machine, so it's not in our network. It's on a dedicated phone line running 24 hours a day. So we've got uh, unlimited opportunity in the sense that we're only limited by the size of the hard drive, not by what our access provider will give us, uh, and the imagination of the lawyers, of course. It's in it, inevitably, it's going to be a struggle for you to get <clears throat> material from your lawyers initially. But once they see the value, hopefully they'll, they'll kick in more material. Um, the BBS for us has generated far more business than the web has. Uh, it's given us a greater exposure within our target market. Yeah? Uh, absolutely. It, yeah. It, uh, I touch on liability in the paper a little bit. Um, publishing uh, material, <clears throat> making it available to people, uh, you better be right. And, and that's the bottom line, because if, if you're posting erroneous material, well, first of all, if you're doing that, you've got more problems than I can go into, but um, people are going to rely on what you've got there. And uh, personally, uh, and these fellows will know more about it than I do, yeah, I think you're liable. So. Yeah, our BBS has a lengthy disclaimer. The first time you sign on, you don't have access to any files. You fill out uh, an initial questionnaire, who you are, where you are, and you uh, are then faced with an explicit disclaimer, uh, and you have to agree to those terms before you get access to anything. Whether that's bulletproof or not, I don't know. I think they're in the same position as the, uh, the hard copy publishers, people who publish, you know, land law, landlord tenant law in Canada, landlord tenant law in Ontario, publish that for public consumption. And there's a disclaimer at the beginning of the book that says if you really need legal advice, see a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And our disclaimer is, is written in wording for our market, which is, is uh, not lawyers. Um, 
so the language is pared down a little bit. I hope it's complete. We're relying on it that it is, but uh, I can't be certain it's bulletproof. We've never had a problem with it. But. Okay. Um, continue on with, with the bulletin board. Um, tracking success on a BBS is far easier than tracking uh, success on the web because of the amount of information you can gather about your users. You're not limited at all other than with their patience and cooperation as to the demographics you can gather. So you know exactly who the people are, uh, the kind of information they're interested in, what they're downloading from you, uh, as well as providing uh, uh, email forms for discussion. Um, it makes it much easier uh, to assure your colleagues that the expense is worthwhile. The expense of running a BBS um, is higher than running a web page, ironically enough, because uh, it should be on a dedicated phone line, so you're probably paying 40 bucks a month for the phone line. Uh, it should be on a machine uh, that's dedicated to running the BBS. Uh, having said that, though, you can use a, a 286 or a 386 very nicely to run your BBS on. Mine runs on a 286. Um, but nonetheless, you've got the $40 uh, phone charge and more maintenance time. That's the kicker. The BBS will chew up way more of your time than the web page will, uh, assuming a similar level of success. It'll get far more activity. You'll get far more email questions off the uh, BBS than you will off the web page. Now this is, you know, February 2nd, 96. A year from now that may be completely different. Um, but at this point in time, the access to the technology still limits the activity on the web, whereas on the bulletin board there are a lot more people, as I say, uh, that are out there with just modems and not access. Um, the bulletin board that, that we're running um, is something that we would ultimately like to get up on, on the web. I've put a couple of examples in the paper of bulletin boards that are accessible by Telnet, but you're going to put your costs way up by doing that because you essentially have to be, become a node on the web, on the internet, and that's not something that, that our resources permit at this point in time. Um, okay, I didn't, I didn't realize I'd gone on so long. Um, the the uh, paper uh, covers far more detail than I can in the next couple of minutes anyway. Let me wrap it up there. Um, any general questions about anything on the web or bulletin boards? Huge topic. Um, I've tried to touch each of the major points. Again, the paper goes into detail in the appendix and the web page step you through creating a page. Rob, I Rob if I could, um, how do you uh, make people aware of, of the bulletin board? Uh, when you've got a page on the web, uh, uh, well, you can in very, I guess you can tell people that it's there, but also yeah. people f find it just by surfing the web. With the bulletin board, unless they know it's there, know the phone number, know how to access it, um, how, how do you tell uh, the people in the community yeah. uh, where to look? That's a good question. Um, the uh, bulletin board name and number is on my business card, first of all. Um, we promote it to our clients. Um, uh, one of the first things we did when we started the bulletin board was uh, hook up with BDO Dunwoody, who agreed to uh, supply us with uh, accounting and tax information. So they promoted on our behalf as well. Um, of course, there's a, a web page for it, uh, for advertising. Something else we did was, uh, was print up business cards for the bulletin board itself, which do not contain any firm information whatsoever, uh, simply the name of the bulletin board and the phone number and we packaged those in business card holders and sent them to all the public libraries in the region for them to uh, present as a resource to uh, the people in the library. Um, we got the number on the bulletin board lists that exist around CompuAd, which is in Hamilton, Toronto, and other places, keep master bulletin board lists and we're on there. Uh, and it's simply one of those things that, that uh, spider webs its way out there. Uh, we've never done any print advertising for it. Uh, it's been mainly internal promotion and uh, word of mouth. So. Do you have a sense, uh, you, you asked, uh, someone asked you today about how you judge its effectiveness and today in January 96, where I guess we're judging by the number of hits, which is probably fair. In a year's time, 
you're going to need more than you know X number of hits a month to, to justify it. Do you have a sense of what it is you'd like to get out of this thing? Yeah. Um, yes and no. Um, we uh, about two months ago got a, a very nice personal injury action as a result of the web, and the fees from that file will pay for the internet use for the rest of our lives. Okay. One good file will set you up for years in terms of strictly is the cost worthwhile. It's presumably a file we wouldn't have gotten but for the web page, and therefore I don't have a problem allocating those fees uh, to the technology that uh, provided the source for it. Um, as to a year from now how we're going to measure a page's effectiveness, I really don't know. Um, at this point in time, the only direct reassurance you have is clients. Um, but I'm suggesting that's not the only value in a page. Uh, we place considerable emphasis on continually, continuing to service existing clients. Um, we don't want to lose the ones we've got. Uh, we'd like to add to that base, of course, but uh, most of what we're doing with the technology is to strengthen existing relationships. And we pick up new ones almost by accident, if you will. Great. Well, I'm going to suggest that uh, you allow yourself to be cornered during the break. Sure. So that anybody who wants some uh, more specific information can, uh, can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. OK. Before I forget, um, when I started doing HTML, uh, I started using a, a shareware program called Hot Metal. It's on the CLE page. Um, I didn't use a book. Uh, I did go out last week and see what kind of books were out there. I bought one of them, a uh, book looks like this, using HTML, got it at the Price Club, $29.95, uh, came with a CD in the back with about 300 freeware and shareware programs relevant uh, to the web, uh, you know, things you've already got like Winsock and stuff, but also probably 100 different things dealing with HTML. Um, I've, you can see by the bookmark, I'm only about halfway through. Um, it's, it's turning out to be a pretty good source. Um, I can't comment on what it would be like if you open page one without knowing anything about it, because that wasn't the position I was in, but it seems to have been a pretty good resource. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Michael. Yeah. Yep, up there. If we could turn the uh, lights down a bit to make it easier to see, and um, I'm I'm fine. I'll, I'll uh, either sit or stand here. I'll stand if I'm not blocking people, but if I'm blocking people, I'll uh, tell me to sit there, and I will. Um, can people can people see the screen? No. Okay. Um, that's what I thought. I just have to stay close enough so that I can hit the buttons on the uh, on the computer. So I'll I'll sit down and um, my talk is about um, internet security, which I'm sure everybody has heard horror stories about. Um, much of it untrue, um, or at the very least, very much exaggerated. Uh, so what I'll try to do is, first of all, um, reduce the, the fear and concern level as much as I can, and then talk about the practical things that as lawyers we should all be doing to make sure that, um, that, that we are protecting our clients' interests, primarily and secondarily our, our, our own, uh, the interests of our own firms in security. and. Um, One of, my, one of uh, the uh, Dilbert cartoons, um, read in the, uh, try to read in the report on business every day, the favorite, but one of the recent ones had, um, had Dilbert at a restaurant talking to a friend saying, I can't, uh, I'll, I'll never use the internet uh, for any kind of transaction because it's not secure and he's handing a credit card to the waiter. And two panels later, um, the waiter comes back, um, wearing all new clothes, hands of the credit card back. You know, there's no way. Credit card information over the internet, no way. There's, um, there's really um, um, uh, 
no difference in issues of security um, and confidentiality with the internet than any other form of communication. Um, walking down the street and talking to the person beside you is inherently insecure if somebody's standing right behind you and overhears the conversation. Um, uh, you know, there, there seems to be a great deal of, of paranoia about the internet and computers, and I think simply because it's new and people don't understand it yet. Um, and the, the truth is that there's really a whole spectrum of, of, of security. And one of, the, one of the best quotes that I saw recently about, about computer security is, um, is a consultant who said, well, if, if you left the front door of your house wide open and somebody passing by walked in and looked around, would you be surprised? Um, and maybe they might, they might pick something up and, and, and steal it, but um, all you really have to do is lock the front door. That's going to stop 99% you know, of the people. So there's, there's a whole lot of common sense, I think, that, that has to be applied to, um, to security. What I'm going to talk about, um, first of all, is, is our obligations of client confidentiality, which, which are uh, very important. Um, I'll talk a bit about internet um, email uh, as well. Uh, I'll touch a bit about the web, but primarily I think some of the security issues are, 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 um, are encountered first when you're communicating by email with, with clients or colleagues. Talk a little bit about network security uh, and, and the things that, that we should be doing internally within our organizations to, first of all, to make sure that they're secure. And then just some of the technology that, that's available today for security, such as encryption. Um, I did want to, just briefly if I could, uh, a, a, a very unscientific survey of the people here. Um, how many uh, of you have to have a password to log on to your networks in your office or onto your machine? Just if you, if you do have a password, yes, okay, most people have passwords. Um, once you're on the network, how many of you have to use another password or, or perhaps the same password again to get into specific applications like word processing or accounting or to access a client database. So you've got a second level of protection. That's pretty good, uh, almost half. Okay. Of, of, for those who have passwords, how many of you have changed your password in the last six months? Because you have to? The system forces you to do it? Or you just go ahead? If, if, um, if the system's well set up, it, it should force you to do it. Um, how many of the passwords are uh, a name or a date or a word you can find in the dictionary? Yeah, I'll, I'll confess the same thing too. Um, uh, and, um, and then just for using uh, the internet or, or using communications, how, how many people use email uh, to communicate with clients or to transfer files back and forth right now. It's about a third. So that's a, that's a fairly reasonable um, level of use. Well, that's, um, um, the first thing I'll, I'll talk about then is client confidentiality. And um, first of all, as we all know, we, as lawyers, we have a duty of confidence to our clients. Uh, and we have to exercise that duty, um, I, in my view, using reasonable care. That doesn't mean that every communication with our clients or about our clients' business or affairs has to be absolutely confidential, whether you're using computers or not. The fact is that it's not absolutely confidential now um, in the absence of computers. So there's no way, there's no reason that I can see why computers ought to change that. Uh, we send faxes. They're not encrypted. They may be intercepted. Um, we have, uh, we, we talk to clients 
uh, on the telephone. If a client calls me um, from home, I don't normally ask, are you calling from a cordless phone? I, I doubt that many people do. Cordless phones are not secure. Anybody with an FM radio or a baby monitor may be listening to that conversation. Similarly, if a client calls me from a car on a cell phone, I may be a bit more careful about what I say, but I don't say, no, I won't talk to you, stop the car and go to a payphone. It's, 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 not, it's not practical these days. You, you, you talk to people, you communicate using the technology that's available. Um, similarly, I, I don't have much concern about talking to a client in my office which has a window just because somebody with a parabolic microphone across the street may be eavesdropping on the conversation. I don't force, you know, we don't have a policy in our firm that all client conferences have to be in an inside conference room and sweep the room for bugs every week. We're not that paranoid. There's no reason to be that paranoid about our client communications over the internet either. In some circumstances, if I'm, if perhaps if I'm working on a, on a, on a mega takeover, which, uh, where absolute secrecy is essential, then I'll increase the level of security. And we won't talk over cellular phones. All faxes back and forth between our firm and the client or, or a broker or whoever if we're doing securities work, might have to go over a, over a secure encrypted fax line. Um, but those, I would think, are the exception rather than the rule. The, the, other, uh, the other issue, of course, is privilege. Um, you, ha you have got to take reasonable steps to keep communications confidential in order to, to uh, preserve both the solicitor-client privilege as well as, um, as the client's uh, own litigation privilege. For example, communications with, with expert witnesses in order to, to make, maintain the privilege of those communications, you have to take reasonable security as well. Um, I've just here excerpted, which probably nobody can read on the screen, so I'll, I'll go by. Uh, if, you, if you have any questions about, do you really, is this really an issue, have a look at the at the rules of, uh, of conduct, and um, it doesn't take long to determine that you do have a very high standard of care that you have to apply and a duty of confidence to your clients. So the impact of technology on all this, as I mentioned, telephones, cellular phones, cordless phones are not secure. There is case law in the United States, unfortunately, you couldn't find any in Canada, and the, the references to cases and things are in the materials cases in the U.S. that say if you are talking on a cellular phone or a cordless phone, you have no reasonable expectation that that communication is confidential or private and therefore it's not privileged, it's not subject to, for example, wiretap um, laws. It's as if you were standing on the, on the roof of a building shouting through a megaphone. Um, that is something to be aware of because it may fly in the face of what people reasonably expect when they talk on telephones. But the reality is that more and more phones now use radio and they are not secure. Facsimiles. Cases with respect to faxes go the other way. They say that there is normally a reasonable expectation that a fax is confidential and therefore sending documents by fax uh, does not um, uh, make them uh, uh, public, does not even, and uh, one case that's referred to in the materials say that the mere possibility that a fax may be intercepted is not enough to remove any privilege or, or confidentiality. Um, and I think similar arguments will apply to uh, communications like the internet. The mere possibility that it might be intercepted does not in itself mean that, it, that the communication's not confidential. Um, and there, there have been uh, numbers of cases where faxes have been sent to the wrong, uh, wrong number, um, they've been misaddressed, they've fallen into the wrong hands. 
Um, there is a risk with inadvertent disclosure that, for example, a privileged document loses, it, loses its privilege. And, for example, you, you, instead of sending the facts to your client, you mistakenly send it to the other side. Most, in most situations, at least that I've seen, that's too bad. Now they know about it. You can't take that away from them if it's, by, if it's inadvertent. Um, electronic mail. Um, I think most people by now know that electronic mail sent over a public network like the internet is not confidential. It can be read by anyone at any stage along the route and with, for example, the internet it may pass through half a dozen hands before it gets to the uh, final destination. And unless steps are taken to, to protect that either through the use of passwords or through the use of encryption or some other means, it's, it's not a confidential communication. So if you're, if you're communicating with your clients by, by email, you, I think, either have to be communicating with them directly over a dedicated communication, you know, straight dial-up link into their email system, or you've got to be taking steps to, uh, to make that communication confidential. And then finally, the internet, uh, World Wide Web, putting up web pages, that is obviously not intended to be confidential. That, those documents and communications are being published to the entire world. Anybody can read them. I'll, I'll come back later to that. There are things that you can do now with, with, with internet and World Wide Web type um, pages to uh, uh, to limit access to certain pages, but generally speaking, internet, uh, as, as we think of it, World Wide Web, um, uh, bullet, um, bulletin boards may be different because they they're may, may be uh, restricted to subscribers and limited by passwords, but generally I think um, nobody would think that material they put on the internet or uh, world, world Wide Web was confidential. Um, now, when we talk about security, everything you read in the newspapers is about hackers, people breaking into your system, um, stealing your information, destroying your, your data. Uh, by and large, not true. 50% of, of the security breaches that are reported, uh, according to um, um, one survey, and I, I've got these numbers from Fraser Mann, who I think got them from, um, from um, through CERT, which is the uh, computer emergency response team in the U.S. that responds to, to uh, reports of computer security breaches. Fifty percent of all breaches are human error. I, f I forgot to put in the password. I, I, I sent a message to somebody by mis to the wrong person by mistake. Um, I, I just simply uh, left something open that shouldn't have been open. I just, like I forgot to lock the door of my, front door of my house when I went out. It's just simply um, an error at, at, the, uh, at, at, at the operator level which resulted in, in something being lost that shouldn't have been. 20% is employee misconduct, internal uh, misuse of the system, people getting into areas of the system that they shouldn't be in. Um, either, uh, either with malicious purposes or, or not, um, just simply to, to see what they can find. Um, uh, areas such as uh, uh, um, employees uh, who've been fired, sabotaging systems before they leave, and things like that. One of the um, consultants I was talking to recently, they, they sell network monitoring equipment, which, which is simply a black box that you put on the network, um, and, and it logs all of the transactions on the network. What they find, what they have found, was was the biggest uh, security issue, is is employees downloading massive amounts of files on a Friday afternoon, and then quitting on Monday morning, taking all those files with them, 
when they left their job. Physical security accounts for another 20%. People just walking into the office, uh, picking up a machine, stealing a laptop, stealing a computer off the desk uh, with all kinds of data on it without any protection, um, or, or just wandering through offices um, uh, and, uh, and looking, through the, looking through garbage, picking up information. Um, I, I suspect that most of us are all um, subject to th these kinds of security breaches. The, this is, you know, 90 percent of what of the bad things that may happen to us uh, communicating with computers are going to come from these three causes. Uh, f only five percent of the of the breach of the security problems that have been reported are the result of, of outside hacker attacks. And another 5% are uh, through computer viruses damaging data or, or uh, hurting the system. Um, which then leads us to the things that we can do to uh, very simply improve the security of our systems. One is controlling access through, through firewalls, passwords, physical controls, and also by compartmentalizing our networks. Uh, by, by, for example, if we want to allow clients to have access to certain files, set up the network so that uh, so that their password restricts them to a particular server or directory and, um, and gives them access to those files and only those files that they should have access to. Instead of trying to build a big wall, dig a moat, put a barbed wire around your whole system, you just have to you know, build a series of internal walls and, and put fairly simple locks on those doors. That's going to meet the needs you know, I would think 90% of the time. And the other thing that you can uh, that that you can do is use uh, uh, forms of encryption and software tools that are available to authenticate uh, communications to uh, to require digital signatures uh, and uh, and uh, the like to verify that the people who uh, you are communicating with are who they say they are and that they're authorized to do it. So we'll talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about network security. Uh, these issues apply both internally and externally and in, in a lot of cases there is no real difference. Um, if you're communicating for example, with clients, I mean, one of the things that you may want to do is you may want to ha allow those clients to have limited access to your own network so that they can uh, send you documents or retrieve documents from you. Uh, that's probably uh, the most secure way to do that. You give them a phone number, you have a dedicated line that's, that's, um, that's set up, they have an access phone number, they can dial up, they've got a, their own password, they've got um, 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 and they've got access to their own files and that's a fairly simple way to communicate. Similarly in, in our own case we have got access to some of our clients um, internal systems so we have, we have of three or four clients where we have uh, mailboxes on their own internal email system. We dial up several times a day, pick up messages, drop off messages. Um, the email includes uh, files, uh, file attachments so we can pick up a document, review it, revise it, do what has to be done, send, in, send the, a message back to them, attach the document, send it back. Those are, are direct links and are quite secure because um, un unless the uh, security of the password has been compromised, um, uh, it's simply just a direct connection and nothing goes over a public network at all. So first of all, what, talk about internal security. Most people say that they have got passwords. Um, the important thing to remember 
with passwords is that um, they should absolutely not be any word that you can find in a dictionary or a name um, or dates. Um, there are uh, fairly simple programs, um, password sniffer programs, um, that will simply log on and run through every word in the dictionary until it hits one. And then the password has, has been compromised. It's, it's, it's useless. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the name, the, the, the logon name should not be the same as the password. There are all kinds of, of um, uh, very simple steps that can be taken um, that, most, that a lot of people don't take just because, you know, I've, I've got too many passwords. I've got to remember my PIN number at the bank. I've got to remember a password to get onto my, the computer. I've got to re, if I've got to remember another password, and it's just too much to remember. So I want to use the same thing for everything. The problem with that is once, once one has is, is been compromised, they're all lost uh, because the first thing that somebody who's trying to get into the system is going to do is going to say, well, the logon name is, is Ertl. Well, let me try Ertl, see if that's the password, and boom, they're in. Um, for more so for more sophisticated security, more uh, thorough security, now smart cards are available. Just a hardware attachment to, uh, that goes on the system. You have to, I've got, a, I've got a card with a chip on it. I've got to put my card into the reader in order for, the, uh, for that station, workstation to become active. So, um, so that gives me physical security um, at the workstation level. Um, you can also have it set up so that the workstations time out. Probably the biggest security risk is the lawyer or the secretary or receptionist who goes to lunch and leaves their computer on. Anybody can just walk up to that computer, just go to the directory, have a look. You know, put in a disk, download a bunch of files, and walk out before anybody um, has uh, knows that they're there. I mean, that is one of the the biggest sources of, of uh, security breaches and, and, and all of us have got tons of confidential client uh, material that's available. Once we log on to the system, for most of us, I think the whole thing's wide open. And, and if we leave it that way, um, I think we're asking for trouble. Um, and then network access controls. Um, the, the networks can be set up so that so that various parts of the network and various either individual servers or parts of, of servers um, can be compartmentalized so that only people with the required access have, uh, have got access to, uh, to specific files or uh, applications like accounting system or uh, what have you. Firewalls are I think uh, quite interesting and, um, and not very well understood. Um, a lot of people think of firewalls as simply uh, uh, a barrier between their own computer system and the outside world. But in fact, firewalls can, can serve uh, much wider purposes. They're necessary, uh, they're a necessary barrier uh, between uh, your office and the outside world, but they can also serve as in, uh, some of the internal security functions. Essentially what firewalls do, um, if, if people aren't familiar with them, is they, is that, um, they are software uh, products, some hardware uh, occasionally, but most of the new firewalls are, are, are software. Which, um, which simply uh, uh, mo monitor communications at points in the network and, uh, and determine what's authorized, what's not, what communications can pass. So, for example, if you're communicating with, um, with say, the internet, firewall can be set up so that messages can be sent out and they're logged as they're sent out so that you know what's going out but messages cannot come in until they've been 
properly authenticated. Um, there are various types of, of, um, of firewalls, uh, and there's a lot of material available now in uh, computer publications. Um, I just went back through some back issues of InfoWorld and found articles which list you know, dozens of products that can be used for, for security and, and as, as uh, you're uh, implementing uh, particularly email connections and internet uh, uh, web connections and file transfer uh, uh, capabilities, uh, firewalls are something that you should you definitely have to uh, have to implement, and, and I'll just mention one company because they're located in Toronto. And it's a company called Border Software, which has um, which has uh, software available. Uh, and the new products uh, are more user friendly. Most of the older uh, firewall products required that you that that you had to know Unix and where, where uh, a full-time job just running the software and running the network. It's becoming a lot more accessible so that very small networks using Windows um, or Windows for Work Groups or NT or one of the other um, products that are available, you can install a firewall software and uh, run it to, uh, pretty effectively. And, and, and some of the things that it does is it, is it keep track of all files that are transferred back and forth. It, it'll keep track of, of where it came from, where it went, who accessed it, so that you can, you can monitor all of the activity on the network and, um, and uh, ensure that, that all of that activity is properly authorized so that no, nobody's trying to break in. It'll, it'll monitor any login attempts that failed. Um, um, it can keep track of where those login attempts came from in a lot of cases um, and uh, um, will uh, will provide you with very high levels of security and there's a there's a lot of software out there now um, and remote access I think one of the more most of the simplest way is, is if you're just starting to develop uh, email connections with clients and, and want to transfer files back and forth so that you can work more effectively instead of having to fax things. Um, uh, simply having remote access direct connections be between your system and your client's system is probably the easiest way to do it. Um, we have, uh, um, we use PC Anywhere on our system which is very effective for our, our own remote access. Um, it has multiple levels of passwords, and it um, it uh, it provides a pretty good level of security. First of all, you need to know the phone number that you're dialing. You need to know, you know where you're going. Um, once once you get through and the phone answers, you have to enter um, you have to enter a server name and a password. That just turns you into a terminal on the server, then you have to log in. So you have, you've got another login name and another password. Um, it can be set up then that depending on who I am, I log in to different parts of the network. So I can be logged in, if I'm a client calling up, I can be, I can be logged into you know, client server number one and only have access to certain directories on that server that have my own files on them so I don't see any other parts of the network or any other client material. Um, and all I can do is, is, is deposit and retrieve files. Um, that's fairly simple to set up. And it can, it, you, it can, become, it can be more sophisticated. If you want to have an, an extra level of security, you can set it up on a callback system so that, so that when I dial up, I say who I am, it shuts off, calls me back. Well, if I'm lying about who I am, it's going to call back the wrong number. Um, so you've got, a, you've got, at that point, a, another level of security. And all of these things are, are readily available, fairly easy to implement. They, they don't hamper the efficient operation of your practice. It's not, it's not 
any harder to transfer files to it. It's a lot easier to transfer files to a client that way than it is to send them by fax. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about um, I'll talk about encryption briefly. There's a, there's a whole lot of material, uh, uh, the appendix to my materials about how encryption works and some of the some of the technology and I put it in there more for entertainment value because if anybody can understand the math, I wish they'd explain it to me. Um, uh, the point is, it works. It offers um, a number of advantages. First of all, it offers confidentiality. A, an encrypted file, if it's done properly, if, it's, if, it's, if, if the key is, uh, is secure, um, it cannot be intercepted and read. If I, if I encrypt a file, send it to anybody in this room, um, and, and unless, you've, unless you're the person who it's intended for and you've got the key, you, can't, you, you cannot read it, and with current encryption levels, it is considered to be virtually impossible to crack. Um, you, would need a, you would need to work on a, a supercomputer for, for months or years to be able to break the code and read that one message. And of course, that doesn't allow you to read the next message, because the next message is encrypted um, with, a, with a new key. Um, so it, 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 it makes the security uh, virtually unbeatable, and at the very least, uh, meets the test that I think is the test to apply, and that is a reasonable expectation of, of confidence. Secondly, encryption offers authentication. You can, you can verify absolutely the identity of the sender of the message. You know that the message is, is valid and it's properly authorized, and it authenticates the contents of the message. They haven't been intercepted and altered somewhere en route, which is very important, for example, when you get into areas of electronic commerce, um, uh, contracting over, com over the computer uh, networks, um, um, but, but may be important if, if, for example, you're exchanging um, settlement documents uh, with the other side in a litigation case, you don't want the, the person on the other side saying, no, I, I didn't send that message, it wasn't from me, it's a forgery, it wasn't what I intended, it had been garbled somewhere along the route, I didn't agree to the, to the release or agree to those terms. If, if the message is encrypted and it's transferred properly, you have absolute 100% confidence that that was the message that was sent. So let me uh, talk just about different kinds of encryption. And I'll, I'll, uh, there's more detail in the material, so I'll just talk about them briefly. Private key uh, encryption is uh, is essentially one-on-one uh, -on -one communication. I encrypt the message, I send it to you, one person. You have got to have the same key, which is a software key. It's a, it's, it's, it's a mathematical al algorithm. It, it uses prime numbers and it, and it just, uh, it, it, uh, it um, uses that to convert the message into, into garbled text and uses the same key to convert it back into, into plain text. Um, public key, they call asymmetric, uses two keys, which are kind of ha opposite halves of the same token, if you will. One is known only to me, one is known to everybody, but I can use that method to send messages to a wide group of people. It also offers, uh, it also offers the verification uh, digital signature capability. Um, and there's a whole lot of, of, of cryptography standards that are available. And private key. Um, are you going to finish? Yeah, okay. Um, as I said, it used the same one to, to encrypt and decrypt. The, the problems with it are that it's difficult to exchange key. You have to have a separate mechanism for exchanging keys. You can't exchange the key itself with the message you're sending. Well, that's not secure. So you, you've got to have either, there's got to be an existing relationship, I've got to, I've got to send you a key. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the methods uh, one of the, that are widely available is, um, uh, um, is uh, PGP, I think is private, 
uh, key. You, have, you've, you do one on one. Um, um, I've got to have the software. You've got to have the software. I, I uh, give you my key, and after that, we can exchange messages and they're secure. But I can't do that with a wide group of people. Um, if there are a thousand people who all want to exchange messages with each other using private key encryption, you need half a million keys. And just managing those keys is, abs is it becomes impossible. Um, and, and it doesn't provide digital signature capability because the key may be compromised and, um, and, and can't, can't uh, uh, it can be repudiated. So public key encryption has become the new standard. And, and uh, for, for those who uh, actually care how it works, uh, the, um, the essence of it is that I've got a key that only I know, and I post on a public uh, facility somewhere a public key that every, everybody loads. You can get my public key by looking it up on that facility in Northern Telecom, various... Um, uh, various agencies now uh, are, are in the process of implementing uh, public key infrastructures which will allow them to certify and authenticate these public keys. If I send you a message, you can look up that key and you use that to decode the message. What that tells you is that it can only have come from me. No one else could have sent you that message, so it provides you with digital signature capability. It provides you with, with message authentication capability. Similarly, if you want to send a message to me in confidence, you can, you can encode it with my public key and send it to me. I'm the only person in the world who can then decode it and read it. So, so sending it the other way gives you the confidentiality feature. And, and once you have, have got an infrastructure with, with widely accessible public keys, you, you put it together in, in, in more or less complicated packages which give you complete con confidentiality as well as authentication, uh, uh, digital signature capability and all the rest. Um, those are coming. Uh, there's a number of jurisdictions in the U.S. that have adopted digital signature laws which provide that contracts and documents that have been transmitted this way are, are valid and enforceable. Um, and in fact, my view is that uh, uh, digital signatures uh, in, in time are going to be much more reliable and much, uh, much uh, more widely acceptable than the old-fashioned uh, si hand signatures on pieces of paper which can be easily forged. Um, these documents cannot be forged. Yeah, well, I have, sure. I, in fact, that's, that's um, I think, is, is really the end of, uh, end of the presentation. Um, there's more material on, di on encryption standards and things for people who are looking for tools and a lot of uh, uh, references to uh, websites and uh, other documents that are available if you want to, if you want to implement that uh, uh, kind of process. But if there are any questions, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and, and in fact, I was, I was, um, we had um, a client ask us about that just the other day, um, um, concern about, you don't need to download anything. Um, if you are using Windows 95, Windows for work groups, or Windows NT, and, and you are logged on to the internet, and are using file transfer programs. They work both ways. You can go out and transfer and download files, but anybody else who's, who's logged on at the same time can come into your system, look at your directories, and take files out, unless they're protected. Uh, um, ap apparently with Windows 95, uh, that when it's shipped and installed, that feature is disabled, and you have to actually actively enable it um, to act so that it acts as a server 
with, with Windows NT and Windows for Workgroups, and I, I, I expect other network systems, those capabilities are always active. So um, you, you don't have, it's not just limited to you bringing in files that, that surreptitiously expose your network to that. The way that networks are set up, they are always exposed to that unless they're protected by a firewall which prevents somebody from coming in and doing it. In dealing with the Trojan horses and the viruses and things, um, simple virus scanning is, is, is really the best solution. Um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't download any files unless they've been checked and, and on a network they should, things should come into a, into a separate uh, machine or server, maybe connected to the network, but that has got a firewall and scanned at that point before it goes into the full, the full network. One of the, one of the um, biggest hoaxes that has been going around in, in recent years is the so-called Good Times virus. People heard about that? It's an email message. And, and it comes to you and it's just an email message and it'll, it'll destroy your system. Can't happen. An email message isn't an executable file. It's just a text file. It can't, it can't hurt your system. It can't have a virus in it. Can it not have an attachment? If it has an attachment, yes. The, if the attachment is an executable file, then yes. When it's executed and it runs, it may, it, it may do something on your system that it's not supposed to be doing when it runs. And any executable file ought to be scanned. But you don't have to scan every email message that you get. And, and a lot of people were getting, you know, were getting um, really terrified about allowing email into their systems at all because it might contain a virus and, and, and destroy their system or corrupt their data before they knew about it. But they're waiting for you to let your guard down, just like that, and then they're going to attach a virus to it. That's, yeah. Um, you know, so there's a, you, you have to, what, one of the problems with the web, too, is there is so much misinformation available on the web and in, in various, uh, particularly in, in newspapers and magazines. You've got to take everything with a grain of salt. It's, it's, the risk is there that if you're, if you're particularly with shareware and widely distributed um, software that you just simply download and then use and don't check it for viruses. Yes, it can do damage. We've had viruses in our office. Um, and they're more, most are just an, an annoyance. Um, one I think we got from downloading something from Microsoft off their bulletin board. Michael, um, could you uh, address very quickly the issue of uh, security of financial transaction of um, credit card yeah. games over the, uh, the net? Right now, giving your credit card over the internet is probably not a great idea. But it's no worse an idea than what I do every Friday night, which is pick up my cordless phone and order a pizza and give Pizza Pizza my credit card number. Because anybody with an FM receiver within a couple blocks radius of my house may be listening and may pick up my credit card number and then God knows what they do with it. Giving my credit card number to somebody uh, when I want to order something from a web page and typing in the number is is not that different. I wouldn't do it. I would download that order form, you know, write out the number and, and fax it maybe, but only if I knew who I was ordering from. It's right. like I wouldn't I wouldn't give my credit card number to somebody over the phone who I didn't know. I wouldn't give my credit card number um, you know, to to somebody who sent me junk mail. Um, well, I agree it's not a good idea because there are lots better places to order from than Pizza Pizza. <laughs> um, do, you, uh, do you have any knowledge of these, um, the sort of the account, the internet yeah. bank account that, that you just debit as... Uh, with, or yeah, there are, there, are, there are now secure transactions. Nets, Netscape has got, um, the new version of Network has got secure transaction capability built in. And from what I gather, it is, it, it is now secure. The first version that, uh, 
that they released was not secure because uh, it only took a it, it only took somebody a very few days to discover that the the random randomly generated um, encryption key wasn't really randomly generated, so they could they could reproduce it and therefore break it. Um, that's been changed. So now it is it is it is sufficiently secure, I think, for most transactions. Um, there are a lot uh, there are a lot of people now who are working very hard on implementing various forms of, of secure financial transactions for the internet, and I think that, that by and large those work. Um, I think Microsoft Network has um, has that capability built in as well. And there are various organizations which allow you to, in effect, establish an account and, they, and they'll debit your account as, as you process the transactions. Um, and, uh, and they work. Uh, I, I think the bottom line is that, is that um, in day-to-day -day practical terms, these things work. And, and that really is, is what people are going to look for. Um, I, I, and I've, I've done other talks and, and done research on, on electronic commerce. And, and, and the reality is if you buy, if you order flowers over the phone and, and give them your credit card, you, there, there's no enforceable transaction there, legally speaking. I mean, there's, there's no way that you, that you've got a contract. The fact is that the merchant has got your credit card number and will process the charge. But if I order a dozen flowers and they charge me for, for 12 dozen, I've got a problem. Because I've got no way to show that I didn't order 12 dozen. The merchant's got a problem too. They've got no way to show that I did. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. So, yeah. Please. Yes. Yes. And um, we have uh, we've been fortunate. I think it it hasn't happened to us. I think we have received corrupted files from a client, which is also a potential problem. Um, but uh, yes, it, it, it's it's going. I think it's it's bound to happen. Um, that, that uh, at, at particularly at this stage of the technology, that uh, files are going to be um, are going to accidentally be corrupted. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be my suggestion. And, and when I say, you know, you, first of all, your basic obligation is, is to protect your client's um, confidentiality. But if they tell you that they want you to do it that way, so I, I would, I would, I'd like to have that in a retainer letter or have written instructions. But if those are my instructions from my client, then I can do that. And I haven't, um, I, I think, as long as I tell them, uh, I said, well, you understand that if I send you these files by email over the internet, that they're not secure. Um, so it's not confidential. Somebody may intercept. If they say, well, yeah, that's fine. I'm not worried about that. Go ahead. Then I feel I, I'm entitled to do that. That's, those are my client's instructions. But I want them to be informed. I want them to understand that that's... And I'll suggest to them, well, you know, maybe it would be a good idea that rather than just email it, I'll put it in an attachment and, and I'll password protect it. And this is the password that I'm going to use. So if I'm sending you a document or I'm sending you a patent application um, or, or a, a draft agreement or a draft letter of intent that you know, nobody really knows about yet, I'm not going to put it in the email message itself. I'll, I'll put it in a separate attachment and protect it just with a password. What you do at your end with it then, that's that's fine, but I'd like, I'd like it to at least get to you being password protected. I'm, go I'm going to uh, take the liberty of offering you for break at the yeah. same time uh, to the public if I could, because I see our time is going. Um, and thank you for the, uh, the talk. The very, I know this is one issue that is not going to go away for a while.
Uh, why don't we take a 15 minute break and when we come back we'll deal with publishing and copyright.